Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in Song of the Exposition now. We're going to take passages 2 and 3 to gather the call to the muse as it sometimes is referred to. Uh, it's going to make us very much think of Homer and obviously we're going to have to talk about Homer and the way in which we're going to be playing a game that I call Whitman's Who Built It Game or the Question of Origins. We'll get to it in a second. Now our assumptions are that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net. Down that left hand side are Talks with Walt playlist from the inscriptions all the way up through it including um, the exposition intro as well as number one uh, section we've already treated. Now, for background here, I want to challenge you to uh, see this passage, especially as the beginning of this, who built it game, the origins. All that America is for Whitman came from somewhere, namely, of course, Europe. And we're going we're gonna to pay attention. Here in these two passages, we're going to basically argue that everything that happened in Europe has been transcended. Go back to what we said in earlier lectures about Emerson in his classic, the poet, his classic essay, the poet, his call for a new poet. We'll get to it here in a second. This, of course, will be Whitman's attempt to have the new Homer or the new epic um, and it's going to become uh, clear right, right away with this opening line, Come Muse. Now remember, the first word of the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass in the epigraph is Come, Invitation. And we're going to see that one played out here as well. Let's as well enjoy what I like to call some of Walt Whitman's humor here in this passage. And notice the use of the word past as in it's over, the old world, the old ideas. Now, because we're working with two passages, I'm not going to be able to read it all first. So let's just jump right into it. Come, muse. Um, here probably uh, Calliope, he's going to mention all of the muses, but probably the muse of the, of the great epic poem. Um, Go back to the opening lines of the Iliad, uh, the Odyssey, the Aeneid. We've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net. And the same game, Sing, O Goddess of the Rage of Achilles, the opening lines of, uh, uh, of, of the Iliad. Migrate from Greece and Ionia, so in other words, the classic roots of American culture, it's over. That muse has left and is now in America. Cross out, notice the irony here and the humor, cross out, please, those immensely overpaid accounts. In other words, the argument for the canon will start right now. Of course, Claire, Harold Bloom's classic in 2000, uh, the Western canon, sought to bring back to uh, the academy the idea that the classics should be read and should be studied. Of course, in 303, we always have argued that it makes sense to know those classic texts. And yet, notice here, Whitman is going to argue you know, it's nice to know the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid, but I have a better epic for you. It's called America. And to that degree, Song of the Exposition is a pretty radical poem. Cross out, please, those immensely overpaid accounts. Did you see the word please as a way to get to the humor of Whitman? That matter of Troy and Achilles' wrath, that matter. Notice, I love the irony of, uh, oh yeah, that little story. You know, that little ditty that whole Western civilization is built on. We're ready to go ahead and get beyond it. Um, Aeneas's, Odysseus's wanderings, of course, the great Homeric epics are what we reference here. Play card removed and to let on the rocks of your snowy Parnassus, of course, the, the peak in southern Greece uh, that is in many ways the, the, the seat of all the muses, right? Repeat at Jerusalem. We're going to get back to Jerusalem here in a little bit again. Place the notice high on Jaffa's gate a seaport, of course, of Israel, and on Mount Moriah, where Solomon's temple is built. In other words, all of the traditions that have brought us to this moment, we're, getting, we're, we're moving way beyond them. This evolutionary notion, as we said in earlier lectures, of transcendent include. The same on the walls of your, now notice you're going to get the big four cultures that, of course, Jefferson would have been referencing in his Declaration of Independence, let's facts be submitted to a candid world. What is that candid world? Well, it's German, French, Spanish castles, and Italian collections. In other words, everything that is classical has brought us to this modern exposition. And so this is, the, this is the argument that Whitman will be making. The same on the walls um, uh, of your German, French, Spanish castles, Italian collections. For no, a better, fresher, there's a key word for leaves of grass, busier sphere, a wide untried domain, all awaits demands you. So notice the expectation here that the muse that he's calling for, he's demanding, 
It's an inevitability. And then on to passage 3, responsive to our summons. Notice the use of the word our here. Or rather, to her long-nursed inclination. Again, we've been waiting a long time, Whitman will argue, uh, for America. This idea called America, this, can we call it, epic called America, the leaves of grass that will be America, we've been waiting a long time for, and this muse has been getting ready for building towards our rather to her long-nursed inclination, joined with an irresistible, natural gravitation, we've said already about Whitman's love of the new science of his day, she comes, exclamation point, right? So, you're starting, one of the, the, obviously one of the early, we're going to pay attention to his use of exclamation points in this poem. When they happen, it's important. Obviously, we're back to the word comes, to she comes. I hear the rustling of her gown. By the way, notice the repetition of the I here with at least five of these. I hear the rustling of her gown. I scent the odor of her breath's delicious fragrance. He loves this word, delicious. I mark her step divine. Whoa, so he's going to talk about a divine epic in America. Her curious eyes a turning, rolling. We know about rolling from passage one, don't we? Upon this very scene. In other words, Song of the Exposition is a celebration of the exposition that is in some ways encapsulating everything that makes America industrially great, right? And then, more humor. The Dame of Dames, using, of course, a very American word with another exclamation point, the Dame of Dames. Uh, by the way, we're going to get the word Dames, uh, Dame, uh, again, in Return of the Heroes, Passage 3. That's the only other use other than in this poem. Can I believe then those ancient temples. Notice all the emphases on old words, classic words, ancient. Temples, um, sculptures, classic, right? Could none of them retain her? By the way, in the 1871 edition, that word is not retrain, but restrain. It's interesting to study the, the, the use of that word and the, and the potential typo, maybe. Scholars have loved to play with that. Nor shades of, and here we go with the classics, right? Virgil and Dante, we've given obviously full lectures at Learnstrong and on these great poets. Nor myriad memories, poems, old associations magnetize and hold on to her. In other words, you cannot keep America from becoming the next great poem. Whoa, this is his argument. All of the great poems, all of the great epics have given rise to, right, America. See, this is going to be his argument. Uh, notice, he says, but that she's left them all. Now, notice the language here of, of, of how the muse has left. Left them all. And here, in other words, it's almost like a rhetorical kick. Is it possible that all of the greatness of Europe, all the great poems, all the great architecture, all the great wars, everything has all led to here? Is that Possible, right? Obviously a rhetorical question because he answers it with the word yes. Uh, by the way, the, there's a, a very few times in Links of Grass where the word yes gets used, starting from Pavanach 5 is the first time you'll remember that it got used. Yes, if you will allow me to say so, I, my friends, if you do not, can plainly see her. In other words, Whitman is suggesting you may not get it, but I'm telling you what America is. America is something transcendent to all things European. Whoa, this is pretty amazing the way he's going to take this. The same undying soul of Earth's activities, beauties, heroism's expression. In other words, all those great poems have led us to this moment right here, right now. Out from her evolutions, back to scientific language, and of course that idea of transcendent include hither come, ending the strata of her former themes. Now again, this word ended or passed or vanished, we're going to see this over and over again now in this passage. Hidden and covered by today's foundation of today's. In other words, the old is out, the new is in, and of course that's America. And then it's fascinating the way Whitman will say this at, at level 2B and at 3A. The way Whitman will make references now, allusions to all of these classic texts, which readers today often have no idea what we're talking about. But Whitman's audience, he assumed, must have known something of these classical references or allusions. Ended, he'll, he'll, he'll talk now uh, about several major classics uh, reference. Ended, diseased or deceased through time. Her voice, 
by Castellet's fountain, of course, Mount Parnassus, poet, po poetic inspiration, right? His reference here. Silence the broken lip sphinx in Egypt. I mean, he loved his Egyptology. We've already said this, right? The broken lip sphinx in Egypt. Silent all those century baffling tombs. We're going to come back to this idea of tombs and being buried and under the ground. And it, it makes us think immediately of Song of Myself, Passage 6, right? Um, Eyed for uh, for a that, that it's an in, uh, ended for a this this uh, this kind of pre, uh, presentation of an idea with that word uh, um, with a past in other words ended for a the epics of Asia's Europe's helmeted warriors obviously we're thinking of the Iliad and, and Achilles when we play that game ended the primitive call of the muses notice it's primitive now even though he himself is calling on the muses. Calliope, of course, the muse of, of the epic, call forever closed. So, in other words, we're the last epic. It's fascinating, right? Cleo, of course, the muse of history. Um, Melpomene um, is, the, is the muse of tragedy. Thalia, of course, the muse of comedy. Dead. Whoa. Ended. The stately rhythms, notice the spelling of rhythms, by the way, of Una, a character um, that in Spencer's Fairy Queen is qualified as, uh, in book one, the true, uh, the true religion, and Orania, Orania um, a, a character in the romance uh, Amadeus of Gaul, uh, and it was also the name that was given by Elizabethan poets to Queen Elizabeth herself. In other words, this is that... This is almost, like I said, we're very close to the centennial of the Declaration of Independence. It's almost as if Whitman is saying, we've transcended everything that England could have produced. Ended the quest of the Holy Grail. Notice the spelling of the word Grail here, by the way. It's a different spelling. Wow, how about this for a line? Jerusalem, a handful of ashes blown by the wind. Extinct. Oh, we're going to get vanished a little bit later. In other words, it almost this is almost sacrilegious. In other words, for Whitman's audience, what it seems to be suggesting is that America has somehow even transcended the very idea of Christian New Testament Christianity. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating reference here that he will give about Jerusalem. The crusader streams of shadowy midnight troops sped with the sunrise. All, everything about the crusades now we've transcended, we've gone beyond it. By the way, did you see the beautiful poetry and the rhythm of that line? The crusades streams of shadowy midnight troops sped with the sunrise. All those hard s, s sibling sounds. And then we're going to get the names of several, kind of almost like throwaway names of Whitman's day that would today be obscure for us. Um, Amadeus is going to be a hero of a medieval romance. Um, um, Tancred is going to be that Norman leader uh, in, in the first crusade. Utterly gone. Notice the repetitions of these ideas of gone and vanished. Charlemagne, of course, the leader of the Franks, 800-814. Oliver, uh, um, uh, Roland Oliver, gone. We've, of course, given lectures on the Song of Roland, the great French epic poem. Uh, Paul Marin, uh, um, hero of a, the Portugal uh, romance, uh, Paul Marin of England. Um, ogre, by the way, only, only use in the entire leaves of grass of that word, departed. Vanished the turrets that usk uh, or usk from its waters reflected um, a river of Wales in England. Reflected close to, by the way, where Tintern Abbey is. We're going to get to Tennyson in a little bit. Arthur, vanished with all his knights. Merlin and Lancelot and Galahad, all gone. Dissolved utterly like an exhalation. Uh, now, this is interesting. It's almost like a breath that, that is gone away. In other words, in one set of lines, Whitman's just going to get rid of all of the classic tradition completely. And he's going to say, past, past, for us, forever past, that once so mighty world now void, inanimate, phantom world. It's all gone. It's all over. Embroidered, dazzling foreign world with all its gorgeous legends, myths. He likes the word gorgeous in, in Leaves of Grass. You can write it to ground. It's kings and castles proud. It's priests and warlike lords and courtly dames. We're back to the word dame one last time. Passed to its charnel vault. So there we are. They're buried. It's great. Coffined with crown and armor on. Um, you know, and he's probably thinking about, you know, Westminster and, of course, Poets' Corner and all of those kinds of ways that we celebrate in England the greatness of England. Now, of course, this is blasphemy to English readers of Whitman's Day. What are you talking about? How can you say that all of our great literature is somehow, wait, he's not finished. He's almost just now getting started. Blazoned. With Shakespeare's, notice the spelling of Shakespeare's, purple page, and dirged by Tennyson's sweet 
sad rhyme. Now, it, we sometimes forget that Idols of the King, um, 1859 to 1885, that, that set of lines and Tennyson's whole project, we, we've mentioned Ted Turner Abbey already, um, all of that project is something that Whitman's American uh, listeners and readers would know, right? They would understand this. They would be like, oh, yeah, 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 Ulysses, um, little prophets that an idle king, that which we are, we are, when equal temper of heroic hearts and all of that. I say, notice the break. I say, I see my friends, if you do not, wow, this is interesting how he phrases this, the illustrious emigre, the muse has left Europe. And then in parentheses, having, it is true in her day, although the same changed, journeyed considerably, another parenthetic, again, how he started this poem with parenthetics, right, with parentheses, making directly for this rendezvous. It's interesting that this word rendezvous, it's, it only gets used a couple of other places, Song of Myself 45 and Two Rich Givers, the only other time he uses this, vigorously clearing a path for herself, striding through the confusion. So he pictures the muse leaving Europe and finding its way to New York City, to America. Whoa, pretty radical. By thud, now this is how she's doing it, industrial. Again, going, going back to that game of origins, who built it? I mean, it's fun. It's a fun game, right? To sit in a place or stand somewhere and just ask the question, sit in a vehicle, whatever, who built it? And all of the parts that make up the whole and where all that came from and who put all that stuff together. Obviously, some of it automated, but not all of it. And in Whitman's day, virtually none of it automated, right? In other words, human hands, the laborer, he's going to call them the average, the average people. Um, they make all this stuff. And for him, that's a far more sophisticated and advanced, can we say it that way, uh, epic poem than Arthur and the Holy Grail legend or Dante's Divine Comedy. Whoa! Or the three holy epics, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. By thought of machinery and shrill steam whistle, we've seen this before, his celebration of the industry of his day. Uh, still uh, steam whistle undismayed, in other words, you can't stop it. Bluffed not a bit by drain pipe, gasometers, artificial fertilizers, smiling. The muse is smiling on the fact that we are celebrating industry. Smiled and pleased with palpable intent to stay. She's here. And then in some of the funny one of the funniest lines in all of Leaves of Grass, installed amid the kitchenware. Exclamation point. We're going to pick up with another exclamation point in, in, in part four. Well, how are we going to fi finish a study like this? Well, obviously, American industry is the new epic, and America, the country, is the new epic for Whitman. Out with the old stories, in with the new stories. That is to say, we are the stories that we tell and we retell, as we say often in 303, but we're, often, we're also the stories we decide to accept or reject. And, 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 of course, he's rejecting the old stories or transcending them, we might say. And to be... Um, again, the, the assumption by Whitman for his listener and his reader of all of these references that they would know that, of course, today readers often don't know it. 3A, well, how are we going to relate this? Notice all the classic texts that are being alluded to here. I, I've mentioned Emerson's, the poet, the call for a new American voice in 1844. We've given full lecture on this one elsewhere. The true poet, as he would call it. And obviously, Whitman considered himself that. Emerson at times thought of Whitman maybe as being the true, the true poet, the new American poet. I have mentioned Harold Bloom's uh, 2000 offering, The Western Canon, where he holds Shakespeare as central to that canon. Notice here for uh, Whitman, it's a purple page that's kind of come and gone. Its time has passed along with even Tennyson. Finally, at 3B, um, is there, as, as we try to relate this to ourselves, is there any value, do you think, in the old canon, in the old classics? Or are you inclined to say it's kind of a waste of time? I mean, really, why are we, why are we reading this poem that's over, you know, 100 years old? I mean, what's the point of reading old literature? We should just be messing around with new literature. Where do you come down on that one? Is it true that what comes around goes around in terms of history. So, for example, Whitman will talk about how everything now has vanished and we got this new, but obviously today, well, we kind of look at Whitman as arcane and old-fashioned as well. And now we'll come back to book four in a second with the words, but hold, and I, I can't help but get over some of the humor of Whitman. I hope you're enjoying it as well. Thank you.